This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. Hey, it's Norm from Test.com, and today I am so thrilled to be joined by the creator and host of one of my favorite podcasts, 99% Invisible. This is Roman Mars. Hi, Roman. Hi. Thank you for inviting us into your home, your podcast studio, to geek out about design, architecture, podcasting, and radio. My pleasure. Thanks These are things here. that you all love. I, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I want to talk about all of those things, okay. if it's all right. <laughs> um, some people out there, our viewers, might not know about 99% Invisible. For those of you, please subscribe. Watch this video first, then go to the website and subscribe. You won't regret it. Cannot recommend it enough. But your interest is in radio. You love. You came from radio. Can you give me a little bit about your background and, and where you came from? Sure. I was just one of those classic public radio fans who listened to five, six, seven hours of public radio a day. And there was like a way that people talked the, the stories that were being told that just spoke to me. And they also, it was also really seductive to me. Like I felt like I could do it. It was, I mean, I, I, I was wrong. It took me years to do it right, but I felt like I could do it. And so I wrote every, to every internship, tried to get everything possible. I had no experience. And then KALW Public Radio in San Francisco allowed me to come in and, and be a volunteer producer. And so that's where I started. And you brought your interest in design and architecture. So that's what the podcast is ostensibly about, mm -hmm. um, the hidden world of design. Uh, for people who might not know what 99% of us, what, what's the one line pitch for the, for the show? It's a short radio show about design, architecture, and the 99% invisible activity that shapes the world. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea is that everything is kind of designed. Yeah, like um, everything human made, human built, the built world is, is all within our purview. That's that's a broad mandate. Yeah, yeah. Because you, like you said, everything. Well, well what, it, what I love about it is that I, I'm someone, I've worked on every type of radio show that's kind of existed in public radio. Um, and, and I always want to do a different thing. Every, everything, the next story, the story I hate the most is the story I'm doing right now. And the next story is always better than the last story. So I'm always very um, just flighty about this sort of stuff. But with design, it, it's like specific enough to kind of be a beat, but it's general enough to kind of be anything you want it to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a lens for viewing um, most of the world. And so that's why I love it. And storytelling comes naturally when you're telling about oh, history totally. And, totally. and architecture. You have history and the, like, design is a process. If there's a process, there's a story. And that's that's the easy part. Can, can we share some of those stories? For example, sure. Um, there's there's great secret stairs stories about the Bay Area. Yeah, and, yeah. And and how how do you come about these things? The selection of stories or whatever I'm interested in is is that's easy. Ideas are easy. Executing them is hard. So, it can often start with some curiosity that you of something you run across, like um, contractor stamps and sidewalk. Right. Or. Um, uh, you know, markings on ships or something very that you've missed most of the times so that you've passed them. And then sometimes it's, it's a bigger issue of, of design in some way about, um, or, you know, sci-fi movies and how they sort of, how, how you can sort of redesign into how people envision the, the world of UI future UI. And that was an like episode that. you did recently yeah. figuring out and, and the lens that you presented it in was, the color of science fiction interfaces. Right. And, and you found researchers who had studied science fiction movies exactly. and said that, you know, in this decade, green was the color of an interface. Exactly. But in the 90s, blue. Right, right. I mean, for the most part, everyone's vision of future UI is that it's blue. And that was our, the title is the future is mostly blue is the title of the episode. But there was this period of time when, when you know, uh, Terminator 2 comes out and it influences it's, everything. It's red. Everything's red. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love for people to uh, hear an episode. They hear a good story, but what they really take away from it is uh, a new way to read the world. And so they can use the sort of the, the way that we tell the story and apply it to a bunch of stuff we haven't talked about yet. And those are the things that I really kind of love. I love I love the people to come away from hearing an episode about the design of magazine covers. Mm -hmm. And then when they're in line, all of a sudden the world is full of stories to them because they're in line at the grocery store. There's all these horrible magazine covers that you know, you, if you had any sense, you would never look yeah. at, never pay attention to. But now you can read them and you can read the intent behind them. And there's a lot of smart people who make those choices. And it's really fun to, to get behind this, you know, 
their their thinking behind what, they why say, they do the things they do. That's an Esquire cover. Yeah, that, and they, that cover and exists this is because why. and that like all that all that busy font that's trying to tell you that there's tons of content inside and I can't read it. Well, that's okay. You don't need to read it. It's it's packed in with with information. That's one thing that Esquire in particular tries to convey. And those types of ways of decoding the world, um, that stuff I love. And that stuff you know can kind of have a story or not really have a story. It, it can just be uh, like a, just a little decoder ring for the built world. And sometimes th there is no story, like if you're curious about something that you've seen. Well, in a way, seen. I mean like you mentioned the public staircases. Mm -hmm. I mean there's a little bit of a story in the author of the book, you know, like he, he had uh, physical problems and so walking was part of the way he coped with it and we tell that story a little bit. But the, you know, the episode is public staircases are neat. You know yeah. what I mean? That really is the point of the episode. But it's the way it resonates with so many <laughs> exactly, people. Exactly, it does. I'm sure people are coming out of the woodwork. I now notice these. I, I, totally. I can't stop noticing yeah. these. And, and so like it, in a way it's not a traditional story in, in the terms of like having act structures and having, uh, it always has a character, it always has something compelling about it. But we allow ourselves to just kind of geek out about things and, and we don't exactly know where it's going to go. Um, and it's funny to me how I, I can't tell which ones are going to hit with people because, yeah. because like staircases didn't really have much of a story, but people love that one because there's, because it just like somebody's experienced it in some way, somebody's seen one, you know, it, and they just love it. That's it, the most recent episode I was listening to on the drive here, mm -hmm. it's about uh, old pizza huts. Right. right? And that, I feel like that's something that's going to resonate oh, with people. That one's, Everyone's seen That one's already a, like a huge hit. Yeah. And you can, you can tell like people love it. I mean, part of it's like Sam really wrote, wrote the hell out of it. Like he really like, he like overdid it. And it's, it's, a, it's a funny and dramatic or like kind of phony dramatic piece in a lot of ways about the demise of pizza huts and their resurrection and things like that. And so people like the tone of it. Because it's uh, it's fun, but also it's just people know, people have seen one of those old mm -hmm. pizza huts, and there, there's something about that as a piece of architecture that cannot be hidden. It cannot be camouflaged. Its pizza hutness is always like rings through, is it's it's like carried through to the end of time, and and I was intrigued by this because we we had found the blog that that catalogs them, it used to be a pizza hut. Up and, paths. Up paths, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the acronym that we forced him to say. <laughs> and I realized I, I'd never really thought of another piece of corporate architecture that was quite like that, yeah. that had something that you really couldn't get rid of the old traces of what it was. I mean, a little bit of Taco Bell, but Taco Bell didn't mm -hmm. quite reach I hops, as much. Maybe, I hops yeah. also have that. But I love the idea that um, this, uh, this corporate entity of Pizza Hut uh, was so identified with a building shape. And then so much so that its logo, it still has right. the little hat on it with the top of the hut. Even you know, though they don't... Even though they don't do those buildings anymore. Huh. And that's the type of way I like to enter in to architecture. Because a lot of people don't feel... Um, they don't feel like they know enough or allowed to really comment on architecture. They don't know the jargon. They don't know... Um, they they kind of have an opinion about it, but they don't really know if it's like a valid opinion. Like people feel nervous around architecture, and the what the way we approach it on ninety nine percent invisible is that we just say that any type of story, any building, you're allowed to have a feeling about it. You're allowed to find a certain thing neat. You're found allowed to find things attractive. I I personally have just a story bias when it comes to buildings, like. I can love the ugliest building if it has a cool story behind it. Yeah, and, and the way you tell that story, it's a very thought out process. Mm -hmm. Like when you said your producer, uh, Sam Greenspan, produced that story. It could have been a tweet. It could have been, hey, notice <laughs> notice all these places tweet. that used to be Pizza Huts, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right? And 140 characters, <laughs> but to make it a 17 minute story, yeah. um, it's, it's a lot of production. It and, is a lot of production. And you want to have something to say right, at that right. point. So there's a, for that episode, you're at an entry point about about Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and the GPS, and, yeah, and yeah. it really has this structure. Um, right. Is that how you think about telling stories? Totally. Well, you, first of all, you, you just have to think about, like, I love radio and I love design. And so when you're making a radio show about design, you want to make sure that all the radio you are making, there's a reason why it's on the radio versus a, a tweet or a blog post. So you look for those moments where it makes sense to tell it in sound. So in the case of... Um, 
that one we had this comedy bit from Tom Usual who was who helped trigger this this whole uh, you know uh, adventure that this guy went in to collect all these used to be mm -hmm. Pizza Huts, uh, and it was from a radio story and it made sense to put it in there and and go that way and and so I, I just always want to make sure that we're th we're there for a reason we're there making radio making audio for a reason making podcasts for a reason I gotta get used to it yeah you can still call it radio <laughs> and it's so clear that you have this love affair with the radio right. I mean you were talking to us earlier about how even thinking about in terms of video it's difficult for you mm -hmm. what is it about radio what is it about that conversation that someone has when they're driving their car with the radio that makes it so so fascinating and so compelling I don't know like I, I am not one of those people that can say that radio is just the most superior form of communication that there is. It's just one that it's the one that works for me. It's the one that makes sense to me, and it makes sense to like my voice and the way I like to explain things. And so, I think it has a few things. One, that idea that you can conjure an an image in someone's head to fit the story is a really powerful thing. I think particularly when you take my subject material. Um, I think a lot of people have built in biases about design and, and architecture. And if you remove the visuals from the equation, you can get people to care about something before they have a visceral reaction to the way it looks. Mm. And so a lot of the things that I cover are, are boring things. I, I'm, I'm mundane, everyday things. Uh, I love those. I mean, it's the creating that, the delta between something mundane and something exciting, like creating that through production to have you care about something mundane is, is the joy I find in doing the show. But there's a problem with somebody um, seeing something and then and judging it as it being ugly or being wrong or, or just not to their taste or that font is the wrong font for that movie poster or whatever. And if I can tell you the whole story of that behind it, I can just like get you to care about it in a different way, and You're that's more in control of the narrative. Exactly, and, and the no, biases, you, yeah, the visual you, they're, biases. they're all gone, and so like I have complete control in that moment, and I can like add that little you know tink tink music to make you you know that contemplative tone you know that it, you can add to it. You can you can totally overdo it. You can totally manipulate people, and they won't they won't follow you for very long. Uh, if you do it wrong, if you like overdo the music, overdo the, the swell, overdo the emotion over something that's very simple and, and kind of silly. But if you do it right, you can guide people through your excitement for something that's really like it's it's it really allows them to get into your mindset in a way that I think that video for me is just a little more is a little more distancing. And so I love the sort of perversity of doing uh, an audio show about visual things. I think that that's kind of the secret to why the show works in many ways. Uh, and it has mainly to do with that idea of removing that, uh, that clutter to get to the story. And it also means that my way of covering design, um, it puts these things on very even playing fields so that language design and flag design and building design, they all fit together really nicely in, in an audio format. And, and a lot of the things in terms of storytelling, the yeah. format, that's brought over from your experience of broadcast radio. But totally. what's what's different? What does the podcasting format uh, allow you to do? Uh, you know, um, there's a c couple of things. I don't think that you can overestimate the impact of time constraint on your work. So the, um, the idea of I don't have to make it fit a certain length or in any sort of way, either to fill time or to cut time, uh, that totally changes the work. I mean, it seems superficial, but like as a producer, it's uh, it's tremendous change to just tell the story, the right story. The problem with that, as a when you when you take away constraints, uh, it reveals the and you hear this when you listen to a lot of podcasts is like if you have no constraints, the tendency is to go on way too long. But I have this history, like a dozen years in public radio, that tell me when to shut up. And that's really important to have that skill. Otherwise, you know, you have these long two dudes talking for an hour and a half thing that... Oh yeah, is, we do it every week. <laughs> <laughs> that's really hard to like, you just like, it's part of production. Like, it, you, I believe in production. I believe in sort of valuing everyone's time. It puts a lot into it. 
Uh, and so like the way that I want to do my show is to make it um, a designed object, like a precious object. Mm. And so it, it requires uh, that type of production. But as a listener, I listen to all kinds of podcasts. Yeah. I love long rambly podcasts because I love to spend time with people. And so they, they serve different needs. It's just like I kind of wanted mine to have a certain type and, and, and style. Right. There's some podcasts. The two-hour podcast might be to accompany someone for their two-hour commute every day. Exactly. Or every and, week. And, and, and for the first time, I, 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 made, I made radio for years, and I was never told by an editor to make something longer. And as soon as I put podcasts in, uh, all the podcast audience wanted were longer and longer stories. Right. And that was so refreshing and so kind. And I, and I kind of really, I felt like an abused child. Like I had never heard someone say, <laughs> please go longer before. And, and the structural <laughs> form allows you to do an episode and tag in a clip from a previous episode. Yeah. Or, and they're just down in one be any, file. It can kind of be anything you want. And, and that's kind of, it's amazing. I, and, and I don't think I've even really explored the form all that much. Public radio has, has rested on this idea that it has a tighter relationship with its audience than most other forms of radio and probably most other forms of media, partially because of the, the way its listeners supported, but also this, the tone of it is intimate. People are friends with the people in public radio who are really into it. They, they feel that. I think that. I think that podcasting has that beat yeah. by like a hundred thousand fold. I mean, it's, like, it's so different. When people are choosing you, there's a way that you're closer to them in a certain way. And then the tone of the show is reflects that like I wanted a very intimate tone I wanted a very friendly it's mic'd very close it's mic'd like I'm talking inside of your head not like a broadcast it's not a bold it's, it's voice it's late night 2 a.m. Yeah, exactly, recording session exactly. which is literally how it started which so so it, it's it came from that but the, the reason I sort of went with it and kept going was because I realized I liked talking to people in that tone and it and it and it as the show has gone on, it has diverged to be more and more like that. Um, whereas I think it kind of crested the two worlds of broadcast and podcasting. Um, it, it's sort of like, it's, I think it's gotten more and more inside of your head, more you know, like a, a, a friendly voice. Now, did you read that there's a, a dig story um, a month ago, original story, long form story about yeah. why audio just doesn't have that viral nature that video does. Right. And has podcasting peak. Um, studies mm -hmm. will show that, you know, podcast growth has kind of slowed since its big boom 10 years ago. Right. And why do you think that is? Is it a structural thing? I think that there's still like five steps too many to get a podcast, which I think is a huge issue. Um, but I, I, I take issue with the idea of the value of virality somewhat because... You know, if you, if you take a virus, a virus that uh, burns brightly, uh, infects people, like has this, you know, like 100% efficacy rate of killing you, that virus goes away. Whereas, um, so people who do uh, video shows, like, so my friend Jesse Thorne, he does put this on as a video series and he does his podcast. Every time he does a video, you have to like, unless you have like a YouTube subscriber thing, which I'm not fully aware of, uh, you kind of have to like, every video is like a struggle. You have to reintroduce, you have to sort of get people to it. Um, I have an RSS feed. So my show goes out, you know, 150,000 people get it the first day. And, uh, and I always have that. And so I feel like we're uh, podcasts are a virus too we're just herpes we like we live forever in your feed we keep going and i'd rather be herpes than ebola because i have an audience that i can build on with with yeah. that and so i think that we're just the right type of virus it's a different type of virus but um, it's, I think it's the better one. I think it's more sustainable. I, and, I don't know. Like I you said, there are technologies that we're getting better, even though the RSS format and that, that distribution system hasn't really changed. Yeah. There are problems with indexing and, and searching. That's why you do things like having Tumblr. And, yeah, no, you, you need other things to reach people and, and stuff. But, but I think that constant, like being available, being constant, have, downloading automatically, like those are much more valuable than if I had like some... I mean, I don't know what it'd be like to have a million episode hit or something like that. But, you know, the the show, there's a million downloads a month. It seems like it's 
it seems okay. That's that, reaching a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, so so I, I um yeah, so I, I kind of I feel like that's not a huge problem to solve. Um, the the whole thing, and the whole other thing is like the sh- the shows are long. Like the sh- my show is a really short podcast at you know twelve or seventeen or twenty minutes. Um, you know, you have to. It isn't a one minute video or a meme or something mm-hmm. like it takes a little bit of a commitment. And the other thing about, like, a lot of it's designed to be done uh, while you're doing something else. I mean, radio is the perfect medium for multitasking. In fact, you can, I can guarantee you that if you make radio, uh, somebody is doing something else when they listen to your radio well, show. If they're driving, then I hope that Ex- they, can, they exactly. can multitask. Exactly. Yeah. And so, like, you, you accept that, you build that in, so the way you produce the work, you, you know, you make it. You don't try to make it go too fast. There's all sorts of things. Whereas a uh, video commands your attention, you, you you have to really look at it, do nothing else, and we just have a we have a different goal. Um, are, are you interested in taking the podcast, maybe not to video, but in different mixed media formats? One of the my favorite episodes from last year was um, John Williams, um, yeah, the, the wild wild, wild ones, ones yeah. live, which was a live performance yeah. with a live band, but ostensibly the same type of storytelling, right? But with some type of visual element also. I mean. I I would love to do the show live with a band, and we've talked to some of the people that have scored different episodes to do that. Um, I I do present the show live with visuals and music and stuff, and that's incredibly fun. I'd like to try videos. It's not like I don't want to do videos. I'd love to figure out a reason. I want to make sure I'm doing videos for the right reason, though. I mean, like, is there a story I can't tell on the radio that makes r- real sense? I'd love to figure that out, um, and uh, and I'd like to write more. Um, I'm, you know, so th- there could be just text version yeah. of the show. Um, that would totally be fine with me. I, I think that w- what I want to see is, to me, the ninety nine percent invisible has become a lens to view the world in a certain way, and there's I think that that can reach and resonate with a lot of audiences who would never download a podcast in a million years. Like, it, it's never going to happen for them. So maybe a book is the way to reach those people. Maybe a video is the way to reach those people. Maybe a TV show is the way to reach those people. I'm not sure yet. I don't know if I'm qualified to make any of those things. I know I'm good at uh, the radio part of it. And so. right now, there seems to be this golden age of storytelling radio and podcasts. And yeah. you just helped launch uh, PRX's Radiotopia. Yeah. Um, so it's a collection of different podcasts that do the same type of podcast and storytelling that you do. Yeah. Um, if people want to get into that type of storytelling, what, what would you tell them to, to do? Like, how can they do that? The main thing is just to make it. There is no real secret, except for you, you work and work and work until you're good at it, which takes a long time. And I just record as many people as possible, cut as many people as, you know, like edit them as much as possible, don't cut people, literally. Um, and try to do the things that you hear because it's all out there. There's like really good, and there's also really good resources now that are around to help you learn some of that stuff. So like one of my favorite uh, podcasts is called How Sound, which is uh, hosted by Rob Rosenthal. And, you know, he just plays little pieces of documentaries, of audio documentaries and talks to the maker and so it's like, what are the little things you did here and the little tricks? And I believe in listening to everything was subscribed to everything follow threads of like described all the radiotopia podcasts and like and and then start to steal all the little things that you love you know the the show that i do even though it's completely an expression of me and my personality and all the things it's like it's like i was like i can take a little bit of radio lab i can take a little Mm -hmm. bit of nate DeMeo's memory palace i can take a little bit of benjamin walker's theory of everything and that would be my perfect show. And so that's exactly what I did. And so I think that everyone could could do that. And it's really kind of going back to the beginning, how you started listening to radio yeah. and thinking, this sounds really, something I, I want to do. Right. And I'm sure that people out there want to try it well, as well. And I encourage them. Uh, absolutely. I, I, what I want and the reason why I helped create the Radiotopia sort of collective was I wanted a path to success to get more people to make the stories that I cared about. I, I really want that to happen. And sometimes there's not a place for it. There's not really a place for me in public radio a lot of the time, 
even though I, you know, came up in public radio and I love public radio. A lot of the stories I want to tell these days are, you know, that public radio doesn't really want them. So I want to make sure that there's a way that um, people like me can, you know, find success and, you know, fund their show and, and, and do the stories that they want. Have there ever been any episodes that you have worked on, thought was a great idea, produced, and at the last minute had to cut for one reason or another? Hopefully it's not the last minute. Uh, so various ones have, that don't work are often things that are a little too visual to, to describe. Um, I was obsessed for a long time of the W4-2 merge sign, like on a traffic sign. <laughs> okay. And the fact that I can't describe it to you is the whole reason why it uh, didn't work as a story. But I researched it a lot. It's like the one that's like lane ending. It like kind of looks like this. Uh -huh. They added dots below it to show what it meant because nobody understood it as lane ending. And it was everywhere. The sun was everywhere. And so I noticed the change. I you know wrote the Department of Transportation, I got all these research reports. Um, only 17% of people could name the original sign and what it did uh, and what it meant. I did all that and realized I just could not describe the sign. I, I couldn't <laughs> make it work as a non-visual story. Right, and the one you did recently of the handicap sign. Yeah. And that's something that's visual exactly. that so could that, describe. That and... works because when you tell audio stories about visual things, there's three ways to sort of cope with it. One is you, you pick something that everyone already knows, kind of like the accessibility icon. Uh, or you can write it so crystal clear that people get it. Uh, that's hard. That one's the hardest one. But usually what I try to do is I pick something that is you can get a basic idea of it without picturing it perfectly. And so uh, with, the, with the traffic um, sign, it just, I couldn't do it. Like it wasn't common enough for it to work. I couldn't describe it well enough to work. And for you to understand my complaints with it, you really? had to picture it yeah. perfectly. And so that just, it's just like one of those ones that just, that's meant to be a visual story. Um, that's just one of those ones that I, I, that pained me because I was it, was it was a classic one it was a classic episode in the sense that it's something I'd been obsessed with for decades. When I was a kid, I, I felt like that should be drawn differently, and I could never make it work on the on the radio. Pocket it for a future opportunity, maybe. maybe yeah. And do you take pitches from listeners and suggestions? We we do. I get I get them all the time. Uh, I'll, like half of them are kind of like you should do something about this without really like a pitch exactly they're just sort of like a suggestion and then we get pitches from reporters uh, from all over who just are kind of obsessed with water towers and just want to like hey let's do something about water towers and usually that's the type of pitch I love the most is the kind of uh, I just love this thing I don't know why and I'm gonna try to figure out why mm. and and uh, and that's usually the entry point into these things uh, uh, I, there's a, a few sort of in the formula of making a 99% invisible. It's sort of like a, a big idea, uh, you know, like some nested anecdotes. And the, the one of the key components is geeky enthusiasm for a, for a something. And that's usually the that gets you into it so that you can sort of let people know. It's like, I don't, why would I care about manhole covers? You're like, no, but really, yeah, you look, should. yeah, I mean, that's what it's about, you know. And so, like, you need that as the reporter. And when I first started working with reporters, it was, uh, it was real, not really a challenge because they kind of loved it as soon as you gave them permission. But they would pitch me uh, a setup about something they really cared about. And then they would turn in a script that was devoid of all their personal feelings about why they cared about it. They were just telling the basic story like a news reporter, like yeah. you're supposed to. And I was like, no, no, put all that, all that goes back in there. Tell me what you feel when you walk through that building, when you walk in that door. That, that's, um, that's the heart of the show. It has a lot of heart. <laughs> Roman, I feel like I could talk with you for hours about this stuff, but we'll have to continue this conversation one way when I listen to future episodes right. in the car. <laughs> Thank you so much again and for my joining pleasure. us in your podcast studio. And please subscribe to 99% Invisible. It's an amazing podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's video. I still think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> We're at Tested.com. I'm Norm, and I'll see you next time.